already be able to uh, be here and, and to be with y'all. And uh, uh, this is Bob yeah. Jordan. There you go. I didn't really introduce him. This is Bob Jordan, and this is Melody's wife. And what's your son's name? Mel. Stephen. Stephen, okay. That's Stephen. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been knowing them for quite a while. And it's Melody. Melody is Melody. Marcia's yeah, Marcia Burglar's yeah, yeah, sister. Yeah. But you used to go to Covenant Life also, right? Uh, I didn't, but my, oh. my sister did. Okay, okay. Now I'm mm -hmm. used to be Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, her sister and brother in law are good friends of ours and known them for years. Uh, they actually both taught me in Bible college. Of all things, uh, <laughs> Marcia taught me an English course. When we first got to the Covenant Life uh, Bible College, we took us, I think it was a seventh grade English book. And in one month, we went through the whole book, zoomed through it, just to kind of freshen our grammar up. Because at the, each class I took, once a month, I had to write a 10-page thesis. And it had to be have proper grammar in it. So they kind of tuned us up and refreshed us. We went through a whole book in one month. And she was the instructor. And then uh, Kevin taught a couple courses also. And uh, so this is... Uh, like I say, Bob Jordan, and we welcome them here this morning to yeah. uh, give us uh, some understanding about Samuel. So let it All right. Pray. Okay. Well, let's pray real quick. Right. We thank you, most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, yes, for this God. place that you've set aside for us to be in yes. at this moment, Father. We thank yes, you so Jesus. very much for your your witness, your your guidance through through Brother Jack and Meyer yesterday, and Aiden the fella and his two kids, Father, all the way to Nashville. Such a blessing, Father, to know that your people are at work now. Yes. And God, you haven't forgotten us, and you haven't forgotten those that you want us to, to minister to, as we are your empty vessels. May, may I be your empty vessel at this moment. May we all be empty, Father, and have you in our hearts, our lives, to guide, lead, direct, show us, Father, what you would have us to do, to say who, Father, are you yeah. going to send our way? We thank you, God for that opportunity. There, there's a couple things that have bothered me for for a pretty good while. And before we get into Samuel, we'll take just a second. And I'm going to read something. And uh, the very likely, Brother, Brother Jack could probably hit me out more in the specifics, but pretty much it's believed that the oldest book ever written in all the world is the book of Job. Yeah. It goes yeah. way back. You talk about a complete book. It's the oldest book. I'm just going to read this. If you want to turn in, in your in your Bibles and, and, and devices, whatever, to be in First Samuel chapter one. But there's just a couple of things that's that's bothered me over over a period of time, and uh, one of those God just showed me in the last few days to to I believe begin with to to kind of show uh, Job. Chapter 4, verse 8 says this. In my experiences, those who plow injustice and those who sow trouble reap the same. So you you reap what you sow. That's what's said in the in the oldest book that's that's ever been written. That's what's said in the book of Job. We we whatever we sow in our lives, that's what we're going to reap. There's 28 references to sowing and reaping in the Bible. Wow. And I tell you, the one thing that really irritates me is everybody, it seems like, not church, not Christian folks, talk about, oh, it's that karma. Oh, that karma. You better watch out. That karma. Oh, that karma. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you, God already talked about it. That's a Buddhist statement. That's a Hindu statement. God already talked about that before they even created it in their realm. So if you get a chance and someone says something about karma, say, well, no, wait. Back in Job 4, 8, it talks about sowing and reaping, and that's all that they are talking about when they talk about karma. Mm. Something else that's kind of kind of bothered me, and there's a lot on the TV, and a lot of people talk about ghosts. Yeah. This ghost and that that's right. ghost and... and uh, and it, it kind of unsettling for me for a number of years. I'm, I'm now old enough I shouldn't be too unsettled in anything you would think, but there's something that's probably, I was driving to work 
Have y'all heard of Erwin Lutzer that's over uh, the Moody Church in Chicago? Uh, the, the really fantastic. If you ever get to hear him speak, he is fantastic. Erwin Lutzer is his name. And he was at a special hotel in Quebec, Canada. And that hotel is a Fairmont Fontenew uh, Le Chateau Hotel. Wouldn't you just love to spend the night there and just tell oh, somebody? Yeah. <laughs> and I say, the Fairmont Fontenew Le Chateau. Yeah. And they would say, woo, wee, Ooh. you've been so in a gorgeous <laughs> yeah. hotel in Quebec, yeah. Canada. And he said they were there, and, and while they were there, this little lady came up and says, well, I'm, I'm like a tour guide. Can I give you a tour of the hotel? And they said, well, sure, why not? We got some time. So they went ahead, and she started showing them the hotel, and I saw a picture of it, and it is, I've never even heard of the thing until this week. And it is a gorgeous, gorgeous, in, in Quebec, Canada, of all places. And she says, well, on these marble staircases, there's a ghost. There's a ghost that lives on these staircases. So they said, oh, really? She said, yeah, there was a lady that was getting married, and as she was coming down those steps in her wedding gown, she fell, hit her head, and died. Oh, my goodness. And now, a lot of the staff, and over all these years, this has been oh, maybe 100 years, I don't know, a long time, they sometimes see her. And Erwin Lutzer says, well, I wait a minute. Can I give you a Bible perspective on, on what's actually there? What actually is going on? Yeah. She says, sure. <laughs> he says, well, when she died, she is ready for, for judgment one way or another. Judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne. Mm -hmm. But there are demonic forces, demons, that are familiar with people. Come on. And they will take on the characteristics of a person and sometimes appear to people if people are open to That's such right. things. So anybody start telling you about any kind of ghost or something like that, you yeah. just tell them, hey, that is someone, a spirit that was familiar with that person. Talking about Samuel. If you really want to know something about somebody, you need to know what it was like when they were born. Now when Samuel was born, the children of Israel really was, weren't doing that good. It was a bad, bad time for them. We're going to be going to uh, Samuel chapter 1. And pretty well the rest of this uh, morning will be, we'll be in Samuel chapter 1. I want you to know that Samuel is a very, very, very rare prophet for God. He is what you would call the complete man of God. Him and Joseph. Oh my, it's the Old Testament, they're about the two best you're going to find. They didn't, they didn't do like so many, such as David, that, that did the adultery and murder and all that. These guys, they, Samuel, he was, he was a complete man of God. If matter of fact, if you want to, let's call him a superhero. He could be your Old Testament superhero because he was a fella that never missed listening to God. And he wasn't only a prophet, he was also a judge, he was a leader, and he was also a priest. That is really, really the complete man. Israel at this time was a theocracy. And Israel was really bad about getting in this big cycle. We've seen it time and time again. They wouldn't listen to God. They would, they would fall into idolatry. Not that anybody would uh, uh, worships things today, huh? Yeah, <laughs> come on. Mobile devices. <laughs> yeah. Well, what did they say about me on Facebook? Well, I'll tell show them I'm going to be a keyboard <laughs> warrior. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. I'm not even on Facebook. We've, I've got Melody to That's handle that Melody. for a crazy <laughs> guy. That, I got enough other problems that have that. No, okay. I better be quiet. But anyway, and then what would happen once they fell into idolatry? Mm. Then God would raise up another country to come against them, yeah. and then they'd be an office mess you ever saw. Mm -hmm. And then, then guess what they'd do? <coughs> then they'd be on their knees and say, God, yeah. please lead and guide us. And, and then God would deliver them. God would send them a judge. And, and they were a lot like Jonah in the belly of the fish. Everything was going pretty rough, and then Jonah finally cried out to God and asked God, please, Save me from this 
torment. Please save me from this place. The judges ran the court system of Israel. People would come and they would be just like, just like you'd think of a judge today in, in a court. But Samuel was not only a judge, he was also a prophet. And of course, you know, the prophets listened to what God had to say. And guess what they said when God had, didn't say anything? They didn't say anything. Mm. The prophet was kind of like the old adage, speak when spoken to. Well, that was the way they were before God. When God spoke to them, he related to the people. But if God didn't speak to them, he didn't. they didn't say a thing. Time would always test the trueness of a prophet. Because either one way or another, it's going to come out true or it's going to come out false. And it was really easy to see if a person was a real prophet. Could you imagine if all of a sudden we had our, our weathermen as, as considered prophets? Well, they wouldn't have no weathermen because they couldn't get it right. That's, that's, what I've been, that's been my, my experience with them. They just, they just don't seem to get it right, do they? No. Oh, goodness. But we've seen how that the judges always judged and the prophets always told. Mm. And so often the people decided that they knew what they wanted. They believed that they could they could they could handle themselves just fine. You ever been that way before God? Mm. Oh, I got this covered. Yeah. I remember one time yeah. years ago and Melody could give an amen on this. I had a nice little car. And I got in my head, and don't ask me why, selfishness, I guess, thinking, ooh, I need me another car. <laughs> so did you ever have a desire for something and you started praying for it, but you wasn't really praying? Yeah. You just pretend praying? Yeah. So yeah. then you get a pretend answer? Yeah. So I got this card. It was a, it was a 1991 Volvo 240. You remember that Ooh, funny little wow. Swedish square, yeah. square headlight thing? Yeah. Yeah. That thing got 25 miles a gallon, was built like a tank, as reliable as they could be. But when I get off from work and I was driving back home from Alabaster, Alabama to Center, Alabama, the sun would get right there and it'd shine on my face. Well, I needed one of them new Honda Accord EXL four cylinders <laughs> that had a slide and yeah. sun about it. <laughs> and oh God, I would love to have this. Will you give it to me? <laughs> Guess what his answer was in my mind? Yes. Yeah. I got a little note one day. Somebody, somebody scribed a little note on my car. Said, if you want to sell this car, I'd like to buy it. <laughs> Uh, my son needs a car to go to college. I'd like to buy this one. Well, I priced it to him for $1,000, $1,500 more than we had. He bought that car. Oh, i got to buy a new car. I got that. Spent $20,000. This is in 2002. $20,500 for a brand new Honda Accord EXL. All of what God gave me. <laughs> It was all of my own doing. Yeah. Because what did I do? I pretended to pray and I made up God's answer. <laughs> but have you ever been before God and you didn't pray at all? And then the next thing you know, you, you proceed forward. And as you proceed forward, you get in another big old mess. We, I won't go into it much, but we bought an old house one time, and oh, Melanie and I, we oh, we were just, yeah. oh, one and three quarter acre, oh, this was a, yeah, at the, at the conference, Melanie talked, oh, yeah. this is a gorgeous, only, this is in 1993, this is only $65,000, it's all furnished, one and three quarter, gorgeous, Greek, refined, oh, boy, oh, we'll buy, we'll give you, we only had $500 to our name, wrote a check, there's the pot right there. And they had a big picture. It was painted in the 50s of the house. It says, you take that picture with you. Keep it reminded of the house. And the house that they described in the house they <laughs> sold us had to be two different houses because it wasn't nothing in the shape they said it was in. Oh, I mean, there were all kinds yeah. of problems. So what do we do after we don't pray at all and then we get into a mess? What do we do then? We get pretty serious about praying. Yeah, that's right. That's when we get serious with <laughs> yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> Remember Samuel, the complete man of God, mm. the judge, the leader, the priest, the prophet. Uh, he he was a guy that, that, my goodness, there's not very many of them anymore, men or women that's like that. Mm -hmm. How many people can you really rely on that really knows what God is all about? It's so, so hard to see, so seldom seen. But you know what? 
That's just what we often do is when we go that route. Let's look at Samuel's birth in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read those two verses. There was a man from Ramathiam Zophim in the hill country of Ephraim. His name was Elkanah, son of Jehoram, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, and Ephraimite. Here's the problem, guys. He had two wives. God never in his Bible one time says, go have more than one wife. Never that. one time. So many of, of the, the Old Testament folks had more than one wife, but he had two wives. The first was named Hannah, and the second, Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah was childless. In that culture, in that day, if you if a lady was barren, if a lady could not have children, it was it was a curse. It was it was the worst thing in life that could happen to a lady, pretty much, mm -hmm. is to not be able to have children. It was such a stigma to be able to have children. And and even though that Hannah was such a great lady, and and her husband liked her more than but Panana. And you could also uh, see Panana had children. And if you want to give her a nickname, you could call her Fertile Myrtle. That's a, that's a name that goes back a long time. But she had a lot of children. And, and, and uh, this curse, this shame on her was so bad and so hard. But did you know that sometimes, friends, we'll serve God and we'll be in a bad place. We'll be in a bad way. And there's nothing that we could have done about it. Mm -hmm. She couldn't do anything about it. But in her time <laughs> of being barren, in this socially social situation of being in a curse, in this in this time that, that she was in such shame, she was serving God through all of her shame and all of the sad things that she went through. Mm -hmm. Look at verses three through three, four, and five. Uh, her, she, her husband would go up from his town every year to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of the armies of Shiloh, where Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phineas, were the Lord's priests. Whenever Elkanah offered a sacrifice, he always gave portions of the meat to his wife, Peninnah, and to each of her sons and daughters. But he gave a double portion to Hannah, for he loved her even though the Lord had kept her from conceiving, he loved her even more than he loved his wife that gave him kids. Mm -hmm. He loved her so much that, that he did everything he could to make her feel well, to make her not feel shamed, not feel uh, set aside from, from the social uh, account of people. Now, your question would be, well, how did these two ladies get along? Well, you can imagine, you know, I don't want to, I've never seen a show called Sister Wives, but oh, I imagine there's a lot of drama. I've never seen it, and I'm not planning on looking at it now. But what do you think that it was like for them? So so do you think that uh, Penina would be real sweet and kind, feeling sorry for her? Well, let's read verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> Penina, that's her rival, would taunt her severely just to provoke her. <laughs> because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving. So that was a God thing about her being married. Isn't that something? Mm. Year after year, when she went up to the Lord's house, her rival taunted her in this way. Hannah would weep, and she would not eat. Mm -hmm. It was such a terrible, terrible time for her. She couldn't have kids, and she was just totally, totally dejected. She was totally out of sorts with herself. And what could she do? Did she complain every day and fuss? No. What else could she do? Well, did she blame somebody else? No. No, she didn't do that. Did she, did she just go ahead and just, just live her life and die in a depressive state? No. No, Hannah didn't do any of these things. What did she say? Well, what did she do? She prayed. Yes. And when we face an insurmountable life event that we, that we can't, can't control, what are we going to do, friend? Whenever you come across something in life, which happens often, 
especially within the last 18 months. What is the solution? The solution is in verses 10 through 12. Look, let's read those. <clears throat> Deeply hurt, Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. Making a vow, she pleaded, Lord of armies, if you will take notice of your servant's affliction, remember and not forget me and give your servant a son, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and his hair, being a Levite, and his hair will never be cut. She said, God, if you give me a child, that child will be yours. Now, she's not going to do a baby dedication like we do often in churches today where we go one day. Melody and I did that. Both of our kids dedicated those kids. She says, God, I am going to give you that child. That child will be your child to take care of his whole life. Once that child was weaned, she was going to provide him over to God. Melody and I, when we lived in Alabama, there was a really good guy down there named Donnie George. Melody will remember Donnie George. He owned some drug stores, had a mansion on the lake. I mean, this was a seven hundred and something thousand dollar house in nineteen ninety three. Can you imagine? I mean, the the lake house. I mean, the the dock was cost what most of people's houses cost. But when Donnie George and his and so they lived in a lapse of luxury. And whenever their kids got to become right at teenagers, his wife decided, you know what? This is a bad place for our kids to live because there's so many drugs. And <clears throat> what are we going to do? So, and I don't know their whole situation. I knew him pretty good. And he was a super duper nice guy, a good Christian guy. His wife got their kids moved to Birmingham, Alabama, some exclusive nice place there, and raised those kids in Birmingham saying this is a bad place. This place is what's caused our children to, to start to go the wrong path. I'm going to take them somewhere else and they'll be on the right path. Mm -hmm. And remember old Paul, Paul Harvey used to say the rest of the story? Well, sadly, the rest of the story was it made no difference. Matter of fact, it might have been probably worse that she took those kids out of that place and went to another mm -hmm. place that ended up being a worse place than the first place that they were. Donnie George was in his house one day in the basement and his son, who was addicted to drugs, although his dad owned <clears throat> five, six drug stores. His son came in, I think it was 21 or 22. He said, Dad, I think I've really done it. And his son collapsed. Mm. He did CPR. Oh, he called the ambulance. His son died that day. Wow. Within a year or two, his wife, I think she developed cancer, and then she died. Mm. Hannah had it right. Hannah told God, I'll give you this child from day one. She's not going to wait until he's a teenager. She's not going to wait until he's 21 years old to give him to God. She gave him to God from day one, and she made sure that he would be God's child raised by God. Look at verse 13. This is one of the kind of strange things that happened. Let me read verse 13. Hannah was praying silently, and though her lips were moving, her voice could not be heard. Eli thought she was drunk. Have you ever had someone to misconstrue what you got going on? Yeah. Eli, oh my, Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to be drunk? Get rid of your wine. And she's like, I'm serving God. I'm praying to God. I'm asking God for this deliverance from this, this situation that I'm in. I'm to tell you a, a quick little story, and i got to mention Brother Jack here. Uh, I don't know, two or three years ago, Melly and I had a, bed, a dining room suit for sale. Real gorgeous chair. I mean, it was really nice. The 1950 Davis County Company solid chair. Well, on a Saturday, we sold, and I know we've been trying to sell this thing for a year. Had no room for it. A lady came up out of nowhere, gave us $2,000 for this dining room suit. That was on a Saturday. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was on Sunday, we bought uh, Brother Jack's old Toyota Camry, red Camry, for $2,000. We believed that God had us to buy that car. Well, also at the time, our, our daughter was dating the guy. And, and, and Mel and I was praying that she'd be delivered from him one day because this guy was he just mm -hmm. had a lot of problems. We won't go into it, a lot of problems. Well, 
we told him he needed a car. We told him and met him one night and gave him, Ethan, gave him the camper. Our daughter's just dating him, and we gave it to him. And the night that we gave it to him, I says, now I want you to know that if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ, I wouldn't give this to you because it wouldn't be in me to give it. <clears throat> we wanted you to have this because God told us to give it to you. And we went on a few days later. Our daughter said, well, Ethan was mad at you and you and Mom. And we were like, <laughs> just gave the boy a car and he's mad at us? She said, well, he, wished that, he said he wished that you'd give it to because you wanted to, not because Jesus told you to. Oh, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's crazy. She broke up with him Christmas. Praise Woo! God. Woo! She's got a new husband and he's a thousand times better hey, off. Come you know on, what I'm saying? Yeah. And I pray Where's for that boy car? often. Yeah. Uh, Where's the car? Is, uh, yeah. And, and it was, you, you blessed him on down the road. That's right. <laughs> on down the road. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. ours and her yeah. review yeah. mirror. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Our, what we knew that God wanted us to do, just like when Eli looked at, looked at uh, Hannah and those verses there, verse 13, it was mistaken. Mm -hmm. We as Christian people pray for the folks that are gay because we know that's not God's plan and that's not the best way to live and that's not is the, what's best for them. Right. But now we're the enemy and we're the bad guys, friends. We have got to stand up for it. God's word says yes, no sir. matter what. No matter what. That's right. Our motives may be misaligned. Our help may be deemed hatred. Our heart may declare, be declared evil. Our love may be called a lie. But we know what the truth is. Let's read verses 14 through 18. Whenever Hannah gives her response to Eli. Mm. Uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, verse 15. No, my Lord, Hannah replied, I'm a woman with a broken heart. I haven't had any wine or beer. I've been pouring out my heart before the Lord. Don't think of me as a wicked woman. I've been praying from the depth of my anguish and resentment. And Eli responded, Finally, Eli got it right. Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant the request that you've made known of him. So, so Eli realized that she was a sincere, devout lady that, that needed, needed something very deeply from God. Recently, Melody and I was in a, a business situation with the minister, and, and there was something that came up as a result of that, and, and it, was, it was a real, we were treated horribly. And I prayed to God, and, and what happened, the guy left some stuff in this commercial building we owned. And, and he moved to another spot. But he's about to move out of the other spot. This is a big, long-haired story we won't get into. And I prayed to God. I said, God, if I can leave the stuff that he left, it was a truckload. And honestly, one of the things was the big old screen TV, even them old ones on the stand, oh. weighed about 150, 200 pounds. Cost you money at the dump to get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I've been lost, we won't say how much, a bunch. With this in this process, I said, God, if you will make a way that I can load that up and take that to his new location that he was only in three weeks and he's in the process of moving out of now, I will have peace. I will be released from this. So I got off from work one day. I live in Kingston, work in Jellicoe. That's a long day, 13 and a half hours. But I went by where this place is, and I looked at the at our building with that stuff sitting in it, and went to his the new location, and it had a big fence, and the fence was closed. Mm -hmm. And then I, maybe it was me, and maybe it was God, but I thought, I wonder if that fence is locked. Mm -hmm. That fence wouldn't lock, friends. I went to our building and I got that big old TV and these old terrible looking chairs and some other stuff. One chair broke. <laughs> Loaded it up by myself. Mm -hmm. Went to that new place. 
slid that gate open like I was supposed to, <laughs> backed in, put it under the in the dry, unloaded those things, got my little truck, came out, slid the gate back closed, and I'm gonna tell you, praise God, I got my release. I got my peace because God gave me what I needed. Friends, if there's something that you need from God, let him know. Yeah. Let him know. Let him know. He's he may not give it to you the, exactly the way that you think he should. It may not be what is in our minds, but if we are walking in faith and trusting in faith, God will deliver you. God will bring you to the place that that is is where you can you can have your have your peace. Guess what happened to Hannah? Soon thereafter, guess what happened to her? As we see in verses. Uh, 18, 19, and 20, she had a little boy. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know his name was Samuel, don't you? Mm -hmm. And guess what she did with that little boy when he was winged? She took him to the temple. Took she, took his, she did. She said, Eli, he is yours. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine how she could do that? And, yeah. and, and then choices right over here, how many times have have, have moms had these little babies mm -hmm. and handed them over to someone else and says, I can't do it, but I know you can. Mm -hmm. The love of a mother is, is, is the nearest <coughs> thing you and I will probably see from God's love for us. Because we see how that God is really in control mm -hmm. and how that God will take care of us. God will deliver us. When people misalign what we're trying to say, when, when people try to, to make us the bad guy, but we know, we know, we know the truth and we know what is real and we know how God is in control. So this morning, remember what God has done and what God did for, for Samuel and, and how that we see that he was born, <coughs> praise God. And, and if all works well next week, we'll go into the, the, the life of Samuel and and just just ask you this have, have you ever thought somebody was talking to you but they weren't yeah. i'm just hearing voices now we're not going there that's yeah. kind of how samuel was when he was called mm -hmm. by god he didn't know to recognize god's voice it's something we've got to learn i hope that at our ages and <coughs> and and today we can actually know what god's word says we have got god's word right here in the bible praise god mm -hmm. the islamic people will tell you that the quran itself is holy the the physical book is holy and that's why they'll kill you if you if you if you do anything against that book we know that it's not the book that's holy but god in the book that's holy. Let's pray. Thank you, most loving and gracious Heavenly Father for Samuel. Wow. Thank you, Father, for what you have shown us, how a mother's love can go so deeply, Father. Thank yes. you, Father, that you love us that much. Wow. Thank you, God, that you will deliver us from whatever life has given to us this day, this time in our lives, be it physical, be it mental, be it, be it financial, Father. Yes. 